Welcome to the Unconsumed Podcast. I'm Lee Corning. I'm here with Jay Curry, founder of Talent Robot. Jay, thanks for being on. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. So, Jay, one of the things we love to do on this podcast is have founders or uh, co-founders or people that are at the pinnacle of their career. And the, the beautiful thing about having these people on when we do have them on is that they're in the thick of whatever they're into. And so you happen to be building uh, a new application that addresses a lot of the problems in talent acquisition, recruiting, all of these different things. So mm-hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about Talent Robot and what uh, what you're working on? Yeah, no, so I mean, I, I kind of uh, I, I equate Talent Robot um, as the kind of the muscle car of talent acquisition and recruiting. So um, any average guy can go out and, you know, go buy a brand new Corvette with, you know, 600 horsepower, right? right. Um, I'm you better guy, have some money. Yeah, least. you better have a little bit of cash in your pocket. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, that's readily available at a dealership um, mm-hmm. that anybody can go buy off the shelf. Um, you know, what Talent Robot is kind of in comparison to that, you know, it's the, the, the 1,000, 1,300 horsepower Corvette, right? So it's got, it's got all the nice mods bolted onto it. It's got all of the fancy, sweet things that, you know, everybody wants on a Corvette plus a little bit more. Yeah, so in, in having read about it a little bit, the, the fancy things are predictive analytics, analytics, analytics in general, being able to parse through um, hundreds of thousands, if not more, mm-hmm. applications and be able to you know kind of double click on that or yeah. drill down as uh, some of the companies I've been around say. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the, the, the bells and whistles? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's based off of benchmarking, benchmarking and assessing, um, source and attract, screen and interview, deliver and close, right? Mm-hmm. Um, today's recruiters, doesn't matter if you're in the staffing world, which you know is the, known as the third party industries out there, or if you're in corporate talent acquisition, uh, recruiters are spending their time, um, which is limited, right. <laughs> to about 60 hours a week if you're a good one, right? Um, on you know applications where they don't really matter, right? So. Um, at the end of the day, Talent Robot's about putting the quality applicants, turning them into candidates, and putting them in front of recruiters so they can take action on them. So what's the process of that? So like, there's a lot of uh, talk around, you know, hey, um, it, it doesn't matter if you went to such and such a college or, or maybe someone that did go to a great college doesn't want you to focus on their work experience as much. Sure. I don't know. I'm just painting hypothetical situations here. How do you, uh, and maybe this is the secret sauce, I don't know uh, if you want to share, but how do you wait? Well, I mean, it, all that stuff's weighted um, at the further you get down the funnel, right? Mm-hmm. So it starts at the very, very top. You know, you, you go in and you apply for a job for, you know, director of sales, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that director of sales job, you know, I, you know, Talent Robot has a chat bot that sits right at the top of the funnel and says, you know, welcome to our career site, Lee, or welcome, thanks for applying through Indeed. Um, let's... Let's talk about what you have in your background, um, you know. And you're like, well, I'm really interested in this director of sales. Cool. So it looks like, I mean, do you have five plus years in, in sales? You know, do you have five plus years in software sales? Does some general life screening. Yeah. That right there takes mm-hmm. care of a lot of what's going on. Is there any wiggle room in that? Yeah. Okay. Because I was going to say, like, I've had a lot of jobs that I'm not qualified for. Sure. And quite frankly, those are the jobs I want to be doing. Mm-hmm. So there's like. A, a lot of companies will say like you have to have five years sales opportunity, uh, sales experience, or ten years yeah. of programming. Well, don't think of it like that. Think of it like this: it's a data gathering mission from mm-hmm. the very top of the funnel. Right? right. We're trying to paint a picture of an applicant that is what that a recruiter can turn into a candidate, therefore an employee. So it's not about kind of sticking to like, well, do you have five years in software sales? Right. Now I only got two. Okay. Well. Chatbot's gathering information there, and it's making yeah. a picture with analytics um, while you're applying, and it's also helping you get to the right job because there may be, you know, another job, you know, right under that one that you didn't notice um, that you know you wanted to be more educated about, anyways. Yeah, well, there's value to that for sure. Huh? So, how long until you release? Um, I think we're gonna, our beta is going to be due in March of 2019. So, okay. beta is not going to be available to everyone. I've got a few startups that you know I want to approach to actually. You know, kind of test it. Um, looking at Oct- October 2019 to having kind of a, a GA okay. uh, for everyone. Um, and, and look, I, for me, it's about getting it right. Um, there's a lot of technology that goes into this, yeah. and there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of technology that already exists out there. 
Um, so it's about me positioning investors to kind of lead them to these companies, put them together, bolt them together, and make the 1300 horsepower Corvette, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's very cool. You know, it's funny you mentioned the Corvette, and you <clears throat> said that twice now, twice now, but uh, if you look at the Corvette itself, uh, it's they're taking a lot of components from different manufacturers, different vendors, and they're doing exactly what you know, companies do to build right. great products right. as they build these things up. So are you using, um, you've got co-founders, correct? Mm -hmm. So are Not co-founders, we have advisors. We have advisors, advisors, okay. Yeah. Uh, are any of them technical or is anyone yep. writing the... Is anyone writing the code themselves? So, so actual, the actual board isn't writing code. So the people that are on the board right now are strategic, strategically placed there for a reason. They've, they've shown a good you know, roadmap to a technical product. Um, they understand how to build a tech. They have access to, the, to you know, good developers, engineers, different things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a, a CMO on my board, which is you know, just a phenomenal marketer, not just a marketer, but just a, you know, a person yeah. um, that understands business and has a high level of business acumen and respects, you know, things that are in and around business process, uh, different things like that. All, all, all these folks are here to, you know, kind of hold everything accountable, right? So to, for the actual build itself, mm -hmm. you're, you've got outsourced or you've hired a firm to do so this? So what we'll do is we'll look at, um, and look, right now I'm kind of continually looking through, like, um, are we going to make this kind of a university style to where um, we kind of crowdfund, and that's a new thing to where you know crowdfund kind of it, it's bad term, but um, is where you put this in front of like a. I don't you know, necessarily think it's a bad. Uh, term. It's, not, it's not a bad term. It's, but it's got a like poor bad way to, or something. Or yeah, it's a poor, the mark. Yeah, it, it's yeah. a poor way to explain. I would say more like you know there there are, there are universities that put on projects that you can segment out different places to build. Like if it's APIs, you know, Tower Robot's gonna use a lot of API, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, how it's gonna take shape is, you know, how do you make the tools talk to each other? How do they work together? Because at the end of the day, we don't want, you know, recruiters having to take another step outside of, you know, one system or not. It's, That's right. It's about keeping it all together. That's such a common theme. I see this from uh, healthcare. I see this from, um, we had a guy on last week who was talking about, or the, when we air, it'll be a couple of weeks ago now, but uh, talking about the pipes and the APIs mm -hmm. between all these different tools, because there's a lot of great tools out there, mm -hmm. but they can't speak with each other at all. So if you can put all those tools and all that data in one spot and have it work in one engine, you keep people from having to bounce between a bunch of different yeah. setups. That's the goal. I mean, look, everybody's integration, API first, and all that kind of stuff. That's great. I, I, I think software should well, talk to each other. So they say. Yeah. <laughs> Well, like, no, 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 we integrate with that. Or, yeah, it talks together and uh -huh. it flows flawlessly. Data, you'll never even notice it changed if it's coming from one platform to another. Not necessarily true, right? Yeah, I was going to whisper lies <laughs> into the mic. Yeah, lies. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we've all been through it like, ah, um, okay, so we've hit the limitation. Right. You know, it's like, well, here, here's the problem. So I don't know I don't know that we're going to take an integration approach. Um, that, that's kind of the landscape right now mm -hmm. is... Your typical ATS, which is an applicant tracking system, which is a tool of the trade for recruiters. Right. Um, much like you know, uh, you know, a salesperson would use Salesforce or something like that. It manages the process and, and it has workflows and different triggers and different things like that. The landscape is extremely conservative, right? Um, you know, I think the biggest news in the last year is like you know, ISIM was about text recruit, and now there's texting. Wait, say that again? Yeah, there's the iSIMS, which is an ATS platform. Okay, um, applicant tracking system. Right, they okay. bought Text Recruit, which is gives them ability to text from the ATS. So you send a the, text message. Yeah. That's it? That's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah, so we're blown away, right? <laughs> I'm like, holy crap. Uh, we're sending text messages and recruiting, guys. I mean, it's over. We've innovated to the... <laughs> we, are, we have hit a mobile device. <laughs> right. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's stuff like that mm -hmm. that you see this huge gap. So in the last two and a half years, actually three years uh, now that I can think back, you know, some of the partners that I have, they're, they're actually, you know, folks, you know, building technology around staffing and, tech and, and, and corporate recruiting um, that is specifically meant to automate a lot of the mundane stuff, right? Right. Um, it is, these are very early stage companies, um, you know, running MVPs and betas right now. Um, that are out there, you know, kind of death by PowerPoint, pitching to HR executives, folks like me that, you know, you know, your typical HR executive, you know, you go and pitch, which does control the budget for something like this. Um, you, you pitch a tool, right? 
uh, let's just say for instance AI sourcing right sounds right. great right oh yes it's great it's gonna help us out it's gonna speed up what and you know I don't even know what my metrics are what should I be you know what are KPIs you know at the end of the day it's like how does this help me right and a lot of that stuff falls through a lot of well, it falls through it, it, it's some of that because they don't know the right questions to ask right. because you know I, I look at AI and I spend a ton of time thinking about this is that in order to have great AI, you have to have great data first. And that's why first iterations of AI don't know anything. The, one of the, I don't even know if they consider uh, when Deep Blue beats the guy in chess. Right. This is, this is an old IBM uh, computer. Before Watson. Before, this is, they did this in like 80, yeah. 80, 90, something like that. Yeah. And the computer beats the chess champion. Yeah. And that would be considered like machine learning. Sure. Uh, Something that goes hand in hand with uh, AI, essentially. Big part of AI. A big part of it, yeah. So, it, without all these iterations of the machine playing chess, it's hard to know what to do. And so, if you've been doing something like recruiting where there hasn't been a ton of innovation for the past, right. I mean, I don't want to put a number on it. What do you think? 20 years? 40 years? I mean, it's come a long way in the last, I'd say over the last 20 years. Yeah. It's, you know, things like applicant tracking systems have been invented, you know. Used to it was like you worked in the HRIS, you had like a catalog, you had this, you know, email was it was a great way to take care of everything. Yeah. <laughs> Which now it's like people avoid it and they don't want to do anything with it. Um, spreadsheets, things like that. So yeah. it, I would say like from the 90s to 2000, um, you, you started seeing a lot of these things kind of pop up that were, you know, helping recruiters. So well, almost 20 years. So it's been 20 years since we've actually hit, you know, kind of a stride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just think if you're doing something, the same thing for 20 years, it's going to be really difficult to, to give the data or the process to AI that you would want to change with. Is that... Not, not that necessarily. If you'll think about it like this, um, the people propagating the work, right? It's a recruiter at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, it is generally the same anywhere you go. It's the same actions, the same funnel, the same reactions, same workflows. Very right. predictable, right? You 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 start to infuse that and, and use machine learning to say, okay, Mr. Recruiter, instead of going out and doing this intensive labor of source, screen, attract, you know, benchmark. Um, interview and hire. Right. Let Let's figure out how you can teach machine learning to 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 actually automate that workflow. Right. Before you go out and check the top of the funnel, why don't you have AI and you know intelligent chatbots that you know are, are directing people to the right jobs? Have you know a cleaner format to where Mr. Recruiter or Mrs. Recruiter are getting a slice of the actual you know, pie that is something that they can take action on and turn into employees. Because at the end of the day, that's all they want to do. Right? right. It's interesting you mention that because I have gone and I've applied for lots of jobs in my career. Are you looking right now? Uh, <laughs> talk about that. Already. Yeah, okay. Um, we, I've applied for lots of jobs in my career and that all these companies have very confusing names for jobs. Sure. So like... Um, an account manager versus an account executive versus a business development guy versus a customer success manager. And then the technical side has their own jargon of their own. It's all marketing. Uh, and then if you go to finance, it's like uh, the VP is everybody's a VP, you know? <laughs> so if, I, if I'm going to go apply for a VP job in my world, mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit out of grasp at my stage in my career. but. For me to do that in banking, I might be a lot closer to that. Mm -hmm. So it's like if you're just someone looking on these sites, looking for the job that you, it's very difficult to know what that company oh, it is. would even hire you for. Yeah, yeah. And, and I spend a lot of time in job clubs like Launchpad and job you know, clubs. Job, What's job. That? So there, there are groups of people that are between employment or looking for new employment. Mm -hmm. They're coming to get educated on you know what the process is, right? Right. What's the best way to approach it? Because look, it is. It, and, there's a kid. There was a kid out in California that actually wrote um, to get his perfect job. I can't remember the name of the article, um, but went out. It was a software engineer. Wrote, um, you know, wrote some code to kind of piece together to go scrape all the job boards, aggregate the jobs that he would be interested in, mm -hmm. based on years of experience and things like that. And then he built another like application to where. Um, he could apply for those jobs all at the same time and manage it just like a CRM. So he kind of reversed the system. 
So it's instead of educating folks, you know, and, and that's what you spend a lot of time is like, why are you applying? Why are you mass applying? Because you still have people out there that are just blasting a resume. It's like the right. shotgun approach to something that needs actually, you know, some some precise stuff. You know, that has to go yeah. in the background. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I you know, in preparation for this uh, conversation, I was reading about the space a little bit, and mm -hmm. on and on LinkedIn, the there are sixty million professionals with LinkedIn profiles. Mm -hmm. The average age of this professional is forty three, mm -hmm. and the average household income of this person is one hundred seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars, which is which is a pretty killer stat mm -hmm. in terms of that's a great group to recruit from. Yeah. But then uh, LinkedIn, and I don't know if this is to their credit or detriment, has a, a third level of LinkedIn. Uh, membership where they can go and, and have access to all these people and as a result of mm -hmm. that you get a lot of emails of, or uh, in mails mm -hmm. or messages from people that don't really have a prescriptive offer for you so they flip the table yeah so I mean, you've got two people you got two sets of just human beings let's just call mm -hmm. it what it is um, you know <laughs> going out and using a shotgun approach to something that needs actually some really precise right. data to make a decision on, right? These are, you gotta keep in mind, people People often discount like hiring. Um, it, think about it from this perspective. If you're gonna go out and you're gonna go spend, you know, half of what the company, you know, makes in revenue on, you know, things to make things better, right? Uh, for, you know, maybe tools or something like that. That, that that that's your people cost, right? Mm -hmm. it is is typically around half is what payroll is going to cost you, and, and a recruiter's out there, you know, responsible for procurement of that actual asset, and like you said, probably at around six figures a pop, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the average, you know, in the technical world is, you know, average job is about six figures, you know. Yeah. Um, so if you think about it in those terms, it's like. We're not doing a very good job of it from an applicant side like you and i if we're out applying we're still not probably doing a really good job of actually focusing because mm -hmm. you know we're, we're out there trying to spray our resume and, and the poor recruiters are doing the same thing they're out there like you know spraying the job over you know 200 something job boards and then trying to get you know the hundred and eighty thousand applications they got at the top of the funnel and make sense out of it all yeah so it's, it's broken it's all broken it is broken, and it's in response to the other side, mm -hmm. what they do, right? Yeah. So, like, uh, if you sit on LinkedIn, you get 50 recruiters calling you, and then the applicant on the other side is sending out 50 resumes, like, that's a reactionary <laughs> mess right there. It is. It's a reactionary mess, and it's just going to get bigger. I mean, well, I mean, in, in, in our intelligent recruiting tools, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's exactly what Talent Robot's about, is... You know, making the interactions more intelligible, right? Mm -hmm. But stopping, it, you know, at the top of the funnel is like, okay, well, you've applied for this job, and that's great. A chat bot, you know, you, it, it has zero emotion. It doesn't get sleepy or tired or cranky or anything like that. <laughs> it's going to find out, you know, whether you're a fit for that job or not. And, right. and it may be insulting. And, and the first thing that you think about is like, oh, well, you're, you're going to take the human interaction out of, you know, the recruiting process. And that's, you know, some of it, yes. Some but of those. Fantastic. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> it's fantastic because, you know, guess what? People don't mind interacting with, you know, an intelligent bot that's gonna, that's helping them, right? Mm -hmm. um, if, if that's what it is. And it's it's not something that you have to interact with, but it's it's going to, at some point, going to make a decision for you. Like, yeah. Hey, this probably isn't a job for you. Because, you know, that, that bot's actually wanting to disposition any candidate or applicant that they have, you know, into the next slot, which would be... You know, hey, reviewed by a recruiter or something. Like That's that. a good point because it's if, if a bot is set up by a system, it wants to push you through. Whereas right. you might pick up the phone and there's a human being that doesn't want to push right. you. Right. It could be a bad day. It could be like, hey, I don't like your hairstyle on LinkedIn. I don't like your picture. I, don't I gotta like go. Your, yeah, I gotta go. Yeah. That kind of thing. I mean, look, a bot has zero bot bias, has zero mm -hmm. emotion. It's not. It's not trying to get off the phone. It's actually trying to get you to the next step or the right step. So one connotation people might have of a bot is there's no wiggle room around like if a if a uh, if a job uh, what's the term of when you go to a website and there's like the job description yeah the credentials say uh, you need to have eight years of experience to do all subjective anyways right right <laughs> right because like like I was saying earlier like. Um, I've never had a job that I was qualified for, and that's on purpose. Right? Exactly. I don't want to be. You're promoting yourself. Right? I don't want to live where I should live. Right. Um, 
So is there any is there any flex? Because everything's coded probably with the bot. Does it say does it say eight years plus or minus one? Or? Think of it like this. Think of it more along the line. Is the bot is actually trying to paint a picture for the human? Okay. Um, think of it as a data gathering mission instead of like trying to weed someone out. Okay. okay? So at the end of the day, if you'll keep in the back of your mind that the the goal of Talent Robot is to actually put the right people in front of a recruiter so they can take an actionable next step with right. that and turn them into an employee. So what that bot's doing is gathering information about that person, right? Um, you can set hard and fast guidelines, but you're not doing yourself any favors, right? Right. Um, you're just reducing the pool. Right. If, you, if, you're graph, if you're graphing this out, you can look at the top of the heap and the bottom of the heap. Right. 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 You, can look, you can look any way you want to. You can have a stack rate. And by the way, you know, earlier on down, I mean, later on down the funnel, you're actually using predictive analytics and science that you know was used in, um, for instance, eHarmony and dating and matching and couples and different things like that to actually benchmark. You know, hey, here's what the company values. Here's what the employee values. Here's what this potential candidate values. Mm -hmm. Here's what all ten of the potential candidates that AI found valued. And here's who you should focus on first because they're the best fit for your organization based on you know 16 or 32 different personality checks, yeah. right? So it's, it's all stuff that's existed, it's just putting stuff, you know, back into a package where it's like, again, you know, the right people in front of a recruiter to make an actual. People actual. like to make jokes about like eHarmony and stuff, but those, those sites have done a great job of showing the rest of the world how to do matching. Yeah, no, I mean, it's great. I mean, it, here, here's one, I mean, and, and this is a shameless plug for a great product, Elevated Careers. Um, you know, these is guys. Is that your shop or is that friend's shop? It, it's a friend's shop. So okay. they, they've actually, <laughs> the funny thing is, and why I mentioned eHarmony is, uh, you know, eHarmony actually did a play on jobs. Uh, they? Yeah. They couldn't market it. They're a B2C company. Nothing really happened there, right? Okay. Um, friends of mine at Elevate Career, Steve Carter, Chris Daniels, um, they actually went and bought the technology. Oh, they wow. had, Yeah, they had another technology called Candidate, Candidate Guru. Which what it did? Candidate guru. Candidate guru. Candidate. So what it did is it took all the information that you and I have. It would be funny if it was Canada. Canada yeah. <laughs> my, one of my board members is from Canada. He would appreciate that. <laughs> I'm in Canada all the time, and uh, I could use a Canadian guru to show me around. Yeah, but anyways, uh, so they took um, you know their product and eHarmony's product, which both were made for matching. They've they've molded them together to to create this seamless little product that. You know, you, you drop in, you know, the top 10 candidates that, you know, your, your AI sourcer went out and found, and right. it's going to tell you who to concentrate on first based on, you know, scientific backgrounds of, like, matching technology. Right. The stuff works. eHarmony, you know, all of these people, like, in the dating, um, the dating arena now, it's like, most people meet on dating sites now. That's weird, right? <laughs> the world's so, changed a lot. It has. Yeah. It has. So, I mean, we use, use that same type of matching technology, you know, within Talent Robot as well. Can you create an app wherein I would be able to swipe left or right given the jobs I want? See, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, that, that actually exists probably with Indeed, I'm, I'm sure. But Does it? Yeah, I mean, you got to think about it, you know. Um, it, we, we, we are in a consumer, you know, driven mindset. It's like, if it's not Amazon easy, you know, it's too much work, right? Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, we've kind of doomed our own little candidate experience. Candidate experience. Yeah. Um, everybody's like, oh, well, my experience was horrible with this company when I was in the recruiting process. Well, you know, it, it's because they're under-resourced, over-utilized, and underfunded, right? right? And they're just trying to do their jobs. So, yeah, okay, so a little segue here. I first came uh, into, I, I came to know you first uh, by seeing some of your public speaking mm -hmm. when you're talking to different groups about how to navigate the jobs world. Um, and we were talking before the cameras came on here uh, about some markets you've seen. And I'm, I'm 33, you're 40, 41? 41, yeah. 41. And so you've seen a couple down markets. Mm -hmm. And this can also become kind of a, a desperate thing, right? So, like, yeah. you have no better friend than your recruiter when <laughs> we don't have a job when things are rough. Yeah. yeah. And so, can you can you tell us a little bit about what it's like sitting on the other side of the phone when things are bad and people are calling you saying, "Hey, you got to find me a find me a." Well, room. I mean, it, it's just like any other thing. I mean, if you come, I mean, and I coach this a lot in the job clubs that I speak at, and, and mm -hmm. the job clubs are people that are looking to transition or 
you know, out of work and want to come into work, but um, it's coming off desperate, right? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's, it stinks, right? I mean, losing a job stinks, especially suddenly in something, you know, it just somebody that, you know, hasn't made the proper arrangements, you know, to get through life without it. Mm -hmm. um, that comes across. And yeah. as humans, we, we pick up on that kind of stuff really easy. At the end of the day, you got to think about this: is the person on the other end of the line, that recruiter that you refer to, is human, right? Yeah. Nobody wants to hire anybody desperate, right? So it's like in the but, dating world. <laughs> but at the same time, sometimes you are desperate, right? And like it's self-perpetuating, right? Right. But it's a mindset too. Mm -hmm. So think about this: the yeah. inner AI, inner machine learning, right? No bias, no emotion. Doesn't care what you look like. If you lost your job, whatever it looks like, it's looking totally just at your skills and some of the things in the background and your tendencies. Mm -hmm. So guess what? You get a much purer job set. So not only is, you know, Talent Robot one of the things that it's actually going to put, you know, candidates in front of, you know, the right candidates in front of a recruiter, but it's also going to help kind of balance the job market, right? right. Because here's the thing. I, I've been in recruiting for 15 years. I've been on a phone and I'll tell you straight up that I've had bad days. I've had days where I've got on the phone with somebody and I'm like, this person's just needy. I'm having to make spot judgments on people, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have to interview people continually throughout the day. I've done that for 15 years, right? Right. It's like, well, you know, my background's in psychology and that's good and great and all, but I mean, that, that gets a, that's a strain, right? It's like, right. I, I'm, I'm trying to discard my own emotion and bias and, you know, just the things, you know, my God-given talents like sight and all that kind of good stuff. Um, to make a, a qualified decision on whether to move this person on in the process, mm -hmm. which isn't the right way to do it. Yeah. So you you mentioned um, like kind of like what recruiting has looked like in the past, talent acquisition looks like in the past. What do you think it looks like in the future? Like, give me like a five year view. Yeah, five year views. Um, again, in our intelligent recruiting tools, to where we flip that little dirty thing that we like to call like shotgun approach on both sides mm -hmm. into a more precise kind of interaction, right? It's, you know, if we calm down, you know, the, the applicants spraying their resumes and the recruiters sending out to 200 job boards and we start to think of it as, you know, this is an actual process and we're going to use automation and we're going to use technology to make that, you know, that interaction better mm -hmm. and smarter and faster and cleaner, then you're going to start to see, you know, the, the people be put, people you know, actually applying for the right jobs. You're going to see recruiters making actual, you know, next steps um, mm -hmm. uh, to, to turn candidates, in, to turn applicants into candidates, candidates and employees, right? Yeah. Um, so you start to see kind of the after effects of this shotgun approach go away, and now you, you start to see a much more fine-tuned kind of interaction. So, okay, let's let's go way future. What right. is... What is uh, Robots. Recruiting look like in, in thirty years. In thirty years, um, remember this is going on the internet. It's on. Year. Well, I don't want to break the internet with this like prediction, <laughs> like the Swami with Johnny Carson. Um, <laughs> um, it, it, in thirty years, it's a much different animal. It's mm -hmm. like, um, and look, I, take this how you want, but you know, another idea that I've been floating around is, um, you know, if we go to the bank and we ask for a loan, what do they want? They want credit, right? They want credit reports. They want data on you, right? Right. Same thing's gonna happen in the job market. Is um, there's reviews that are people that people are doing right now that are kept under lock and key in the HR department of particular companies. Your reviews, right? You, everybody gets a review. Somebody gets reviewed, and you know that's how they get a raise or an adjustment, or that's how they get fired, or you know whatever it is. If you get bad reviews, at the end of the day, you're making hundred thousand dollar decisions based on mm -hmm. what. So you think at some point that'll all just be opened up? Absolutely. And you'll be able to see like, uh, well, so one of the biggest things that I've come across on resumes is like a uh, little bit of fudging of the numbers. Well, think or, about it. I mean, it's it is a it's still a very human driven thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you're a sales guy, right? Everybody's a good salesperson on a resume and a phone call. <laughs> I mean. I'm not going to give you a bad resume, I'm not going to give you a bad reference, and I'm not going to do a crappy job on the phone, right? Well, I, I think it's harder to prove it on the phone, or when you get live, it's harder to back it up. Yeah. But yeah. you can get in with a falsified resume, I assume. I sure, know. absolutely, and it happens all the time. I mean, it's bad juju, really. You know, you think about it, it's like, mm -hmm. well, you know, yeah, you say you had seven, let's talk about it in the interview, and it comes out in the interview, and you're like, well, it really wasn't my project, it was, I was on the project. 
And that's fine. You know, it's all fine and good, but it's it's all about opening a door, right? Right. And that's humans being humans. It's like, hey, we're scrappy. We want to get in the door. We want to figure out, you know, how to promote yourself, right? Right. It's like you said, you never had a job you were qualified for. Didn't mean you fudged your resume. It just means that you did a good job, you know, kind of interviewing and convincing the people that, hey, you're qualified to do what you need to do. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we talk about this pretty often on the podcast is our audience is pretty squarely at like the 24 to 35 range. Mm-hmm. So everyone in that range is like kind of in a scrappy time in their sure. career where they're trying to, you know, go one leg up, go go one place higher, be, be where they want to be in the future mm-hmm. as well. Because that's something that I think our generation deals with a little bit. Um, and so I think there's this conversation around potential mm-hmm. that is, is a, would be a Horribly tough thing to quantify, right? Potential? Yeah. Really? You don't think so? Not at all. Okay, well, let's all. have that. So right? potential, I mean, that, that I mean, it, it, if you put that into an algorithm, right? Mm-hmm. So you do the same thing repetitively. You see trends in anything, right? Right. You know, someone um, that, that is consistent on promotion, job tracks, right? Um, I look for, you know, job tracks that, you know, aren't lateral moves, but maybe moves in, in, a, in a certain way, right? If I'm looking for a CMO, I'm really out scouring for, you know, VPs of marketing or SVPs of marketing right. that maybe have a CMO under them, but I can tell they really did all the work, right? So there's trends out there that you can train machine, you know, algorithms to kind of look for, and you can bring those people forward, right? Interesting. Yeah. It, would it be... Well, how about this? What if they don't have that history? Say you're 25 and you're in your second job, like, mm-hmm. and the, the history is four years, three years. There's a classification there. So, I mean, what job are you applying for? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, and that's, that cuts it in any different way. Right. right. So that's why. If you're applying for a VP job at 25 fresh out of college. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get the job, right. man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's... Good luck. Right. But, we wish you the best, but it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, so it's just like, uh, there are there are... In, in, I'll just use a sales career as an example because it's the one I know the best. But mm-hmm. there are like different watermarks that you can get to where it's difficult to break into the next level. So like um, most people start out in sales inside. as an inside rep or on the phones. On the phones, you hear the stories from every everyone that tells their story about how it got going, and uh, there's there's a there's a a gate they have to go through that very few people can make it through right and it's hard to say that early on who's going to be able to make it and, right and but then there's also like the stigma around like okay you got too old before you made it through the gate you're not going anywhere but you know uh <laughs> i don't know like is that sounds like you've interviewed a few people <laughs> are you looked at a few resumes <laughs> but it's like i look at i look at some of these people and i say man this guy is XYZ age and he's just like he's spent so much time As getting an account ready. manager or, or you know or exactly so and now he is ready you look at tendencies like that but here's the mm-hmm. thing it's like we're not supposed to we're not supposed to enter into the age thing right there's a thing called this you know, discrimination age discrimination yeah. right so at the end of the day it's like there <laughs> the beauty of it is that there's tools out there that will actually you know kind of put a recruiter in blind mode mm-hmm. um, and it's called you know like um I can't remember the, the actual term for it, but what it does, it takes out anything um, that would relate that person to be male or female, you know, Republican, Democrat, or whatever it is, yeah. um, and pull all that out so that you're only looking at, uh, at objective data, things that you can take action on and, you know, make a qualified decision on, you know, where this person belongs. So do you think Talent Robot closes out some of the legal liability? A hundred percent. Yeah. So, I mean, think about it. Think about it. So, who gets in trouble for discrimination? Uh, Humans. Yeah, okay. Well, I was going to say the companies and... Humans. Well, the (laughs) tax code recognizes them as humans. Right. I mean, that's exactly right. At the end of the day, who are you paying? And those are, well, there's a discrepancy. It's not saying, saying, well, your software product Mm -hmm. is discriminatory. I mean, you program it to be that way, but try filing a lawsuit on a piece of software. It doesn't work that often. Um, especially if you think it's a discrimination. Now, if you think it's something else and it doesn't work, there's plenty of lawsuits on software, don't get me wrong. But, yeah, I was going to say, I've but, heard of a couple. Yeah, there's only a few, right? <laughs> but think about it, you know, from a discriminatory practice is, if you have talent acquisition leaders and HR leaders out there that are, you know, 
um, they're looking for diversity in their in their culture and work groups and, and you know to, to expand their company um, they can actually you know promote that you know with you know looking through things with with artificial intelligence right. looking at predictive analytics spots different things like that uh, to bring these people up right because here's the thing is like we keep we keep pushing this whole like well, diversity is the next thing in, in recruiting, and, and that's discriminatory, if you ask me. It, it really yeah. is. Think about it. It's like... I, I don't know anything about it. I'm always the guy <laughs> asking, like, hey, can I have this job? Yeah, I mean, and, that, and that's right. But, right. you know, the, the secret behind it is, like, we need a, a more, you know, diverse work, you know, mm -hmm. thing. So it's like automatically we're starting to discriminate against people that don't fit into a qualification. Yeah, it, like, starts to, uh, you know positive feedback loop well, wow, even negative right so it's like well it's if it's the circle's going this way right I'm doing this for the camera right uh, <laughs> that if you're going right all of a sudden you're going left exactly yeah. at some point you're gonna go left right right and so it, it eats itself a little bit and so I'll, I'll leave that to people with higher pay grade to sort out <laughs> Not, not for me to live in. You don't want to talk about discrimination here? We, I mean, we got what? Another half hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know if we can leave that. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so we, like I said, we were talking to we're talking to young professionals here. So if if I'm trying to map out my career as a 24 year old, uh, I I'd call a 24 year old a kid. I don't know if that's discriminatory, is it not? I don't know. Yes. Uh, is it? No, I'm just kidding. I was definitely a kid. I don't know. I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> growing immune to that stuff. <laughs> Good for you. I'm feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> Anyways, uh, if so, I, you hear a lot of uh, theories around like what is the best career trajectory to try to take on. Sure. And so, um, you, like, uh, it's very. I, I shouldn't say it's very rare. It's more rare to see people that have been at the same company their entire career now than yeah. ever. Yeah. So it almost comes as natural to to observe that and say, is that not the way you want to go anymore? Because, uh, well, I got my first job, I got my first um, software job at IBM and I came home, told my dad, and he was like, never ever leave, leave IBM. Yeah. And then obviously I am in a dynamic marketplace and moved on out, but- People knocking on your door. What, what's changed that's that brought this on? Well, it's the entire landscape. I mean, the war for talent. That's the whole new thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, think about this. There was a few companies that everybody wanted to work for because they had nice fat pensions and good retirement plans. Right. And, and it was a nice, comfy workspace. Um, those were the Goldman Sachs and, you know, the IBMs of the world. Um, and, and, and now, all of a sudden, you've got this radical marketplace, especially yeah. in technology. It has got wild. It, it is crazy because... Here's the thing is like they're actually the majority, right? Mm -hmm. So the majority of the folks are actually working for more, you know, the more of the diverse companies, more of the, you know, the startup type companies that aren't the IBMs and Amazons and, you know, Googles and different things like that of the world, right? Right. There's a bigger workforce there. And the reason is, is because actively, you know, the recruiters and talent acquisition professionals on the corporate side and even staffing agencies have been tasked with hey, go get X, Y, go get X person out of Google. We need Y person out of Amazon because we need this software application to mimic some of the things that it does, all right? that That's kind of the war for talent. So mm -hmm. you start to see this division like, okay, so 30 years ago, you know, 10 years was, you know, 10 to 15 years was kind of the, the norm to stay at a job. If not, you're like, dude, you job hopper, you know, why, why are you applying for this role? You're only 12 years into your role. Nowadays, it's like, 12 years, man. I mean, you only know, you know, the way that IBM does things or the way that, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, and, and people aren't willing to take a risk on you, right? They're not willing to take a risk on you, especially in a small operation. Say you're a $50 million startup, tech startup. Yeah. Um, they're looking for individuals that have multiple, you know, experiences in multiple different companies because process isn't always built up, you know. Right. Um, there's, there's a ton of ambiguity that exists in each one of those. And, um, people that can deal with that kind of stuff, it's almost like a ghost skill set, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why you're starting to see a lot of people just, you know, kind of tag out and say, you know, I did my two years here, peace, I'm 25, 27 now, I've had a bunch of recruiters recruiters call, I'm going to promote myself. Self-promotion today is the best way to kind of get ahead. Yeah. And, and eventually, mid-level career, uh, everybody hits a stride to where, 
you know, you want to see four or five years, right? You want to see that four or five year tenure, right? But you want to see a gradual promotion within that. So if you're working for a company, you know, for five, six, even seven, or even ten years now, it could be a large company like Google, and you want to see this person making positive strides, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe even, even multidisciplinary type, you know, strides like yeah, that's a good point. Marketing to sales, right? that's that's a good one. Or sales to marketing. Right. For instance, my brother did the same thing. You know, he was always a sales guy in wireless, right? Mm -hmm. um, and made the switch over to marketing, and you know, is now an executive in marketing. Interesting. Yeah. So, you're you're the guy building the AI recruiting robot. Not me. I'm not that smart. Well, you're <laughs> you're doing. It. You're writing the check at least. Yeah. Uh, if I'm if I'm 22, 23, somewhere in there, and I'm trying to craft a job experience that AI recruiting platforms will find favorable. Mm -hmm. What am I trying to do? Do well, I want to have trying to game the system? Well, I want to be well. So yeah, I'm obviously trying to exactly. Game the if I was trying to fight fair, I'd flip coins for a living. Right. <laughs> so if I if I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, okay, so the 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 robots that are the algorithms that are controlling this, or the AI, whatever you want to call it, is looking for three to five year stints or seven to 10 year stints. Well, how do you know that? Cross-functional, what, what's, what, is, what is going to be highly sought after? What's gonna be highly sought after is people that are educated about it. So the, the thing that you talked about, it, mm -hmm. it actually kind of does a, a 360 degree. So yeah. you, you start, doesn't matter where it starts, if it's, if it's the general applicant pool out there mm -hmm. or if it's talent acquisition professionals, once you start to hone in the process and make it more automated right. and less biased, the other side of it takes effect. So you got better educated job you know, seekers, you have better educated folks not trying to game the system anymore. We're so used to gaming the system. Like one of the practices that I heard from one of the job clubs that I actually speak at was they're putting white lettering of in, in the border of their resume because right now SEO is kind of the game in an ATS, right? Okay, that's Why, clever. Right, and, and getting all these hashtag, I mean, all of these key words, uh, it's where the ATS is populating, bringing those guys right up front. It's like 1994 SEO. Right, it's right? exactly what it is, yeah. man. It's exactly what it is, but, it, but it's now that kind of game, right? Uh -huh. It's like, it's not on my resume, but it's on my resume. Mm -hmm. But you're getting the interview because you know you're a stellar interviewer. That's great and all, right? But as a 25-year-old professional looking to, you know, take their next leap or, or do something like that, right. um, let fate take its chance. I mean, it's, it, you, you don't have to gain the system anymore. Uh, especially, you know, if a company's using something, you know, the talent robot is one of the things where they're dropping in as an applicant. They're, they're interacting with, you know, bots and, you know, they're interacting, you know, at the very top of the funnel that's gonna kind of predict, you know, hey, where does this person belong and what's the best actual place for them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not about like looking at a careers page and go, oh, I can do that, scroll down, I can do that, so I'm gonna apply for that, and I can do that. It's about interacting with something as soon as you land on a careers page, understanding what your, you know, your talents, your skills, uh, things like that, and then actually getting to the right job, mm -hmm. and from there, you know, actually having a really good experience down through the middle of a funnel by gathering data and you know, being presented to somebody that can make an actual decision on um, that person, right? So it's yeah. all going to change. There's no really like I can't tell you how to hack the system or anything. Well, I mean, and, and I'd, I'd love to be able to hack the system. I'm not going to lie to you, but um, what can like in extremely practical terms, if if we're in this dynamic marketplace and for whatever reason it's less desirable to stay at a company for 25 years, 30 sure. years, 35 years, I don't know, whatever you want to call an entire career, than it was historically. Something is shifting where they're saying, all right, so it makes a lot more sense to be at a spot. Like, how long should I stay at my first job? Well, like, we'll make it super practical. Sure. I mean, well, I mean, there's not really, there's there's not really an number. answer to that. There's how not about, a number. How about six months? It, too short? Well, think about it. There's all kinds of stories for six months, you know? I got in there, you know, they sold me on, you know, it was a financial analyst role. I was really mopping floors. I was okay with that for like three months. They said I'd get to the financial analyst, but I kept <laughs> mopping floors after six months. Right. There's always a story in the back end. We're, we're not concerned. I mean, look, I'm not, especially. And the people that, you know, want to use this product and that, that are going to buy this product, they're not concerned with, 
you know, levels of experience and you know, all that. That's stuff that recruiters do nowadays, naturally. They look at things and we're having to make snap judgments on LinkedIn or whatever uh, to try to figure out who's the best, you know, candidate or target at that point right. to actually approach. So, um, there's not a real answer for your question. I can tell you one of the best things for a person like that to have is a very clean and presentable web presence, okay? Not just a LinkedIn profile. Um, you know, if it's a software engineer, have a GitHub profile to where, you yeah. know, you're contributing. You know, you're contributing to something that, you know, a community that's open source. I mean, there's tools right now that search GitHub, you know, for software engineers. And it's yeah. AI based, right? Um, have, have those things in line. The resume will go away. I know people have said that. But it's actually going to go away. I mean, think about it. It is. How long do you think on that? Well, we got one more generation right now in executive leadership that like to see the resume, right? So think about a generational gap. You got about twenty years there. It'll go away eventually. Okay. Um, probably in a faster track, but you know, web presence is probably going to be, you know, it, it's so cheap and attainable today. You know, to get a personal right. website, to to go out and build a free profile on LinkedIn, um, do a GitHub, you know, you know. Uh, profile to where you're contributing code and you know do different things like that um, that's what AI is going out and looking for it's called sourcing right mm -hmm. um, and it's all passive talent so you start to see this this switch right it's like you, the hunted become the hunter right <laughs> so my circle your now. circle of life is coming yeah. back here so it's <laughs> It's like, jobs. Right, have a clean web presence, mm -hmm. right? Have a good job, and you know, if you're interested in other jobs, take a peek and look and go interact with the right kind of tool sets to make a good decision. So what, what does a clean web presence look like for someone that's not a coder? Telling the same story across multiple profiles, LinkedIn, like if you got a personal website, Facebook, Twitter. What do you mean, how would I tell a similar story on Facebook and LinkedIn. So it's one of the things you click on there like this is not Well like on LinkedIn right? like on LinkedIn like you've seen this and every recruiter's seen it, right? Mm -hmm. On LinkedIn you got this professional picture, you got your tie on, maybe your favorite coat, you got everything buttoned up with all your experience and everything like that. And then pop over to your Facebook page and you know your your opening picture is a uh, of you, you know, downing a, bo a bottle of Bacardi or something with, you know, like I don't know, some sort of like weird flaming, like, I don't know, flames coming from your fingers. It's a different story, right? So right. you have to understand that today, all of that You're stuff is You're getting Googled. You're getting Googled. And, and I guess right. that's a great term for it, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's like all Unless I have to do. Unless you're Microsoft. Huh? Unless you're Microsoft. Well, yeah. I mean. Or Bing. Or Yahoo Search. You got Bing. You got Bing. <laughs> you might have something there. <laughs> but yeah, think about it like that. It's like, you know, recruiters aren't just looking at Facebook, LinkedIn, and like your resume. They're looking at everything. Yep. Um, everything's online now. It sure is. And, and and not to mention there's companies like Axiom out there that have been gathering data on you for years, right? Your buying tendencies, your habits, your where you've moved, where you've lived, what streets you've lived on, what kind of houses you've looked at to purchase. All this other, all this stuff is gathered, mm -hmm. and, and look, there's technology out there today that, that can say, you know, based on what this person does on the web, and based on what this person does on the web, these two are match, right? Because that's that's our real, that's that's who we are, right? <laughs> yeah. Wait. So you mean the matches in like Match.com or like, like matches in like Job Match? It's the same. There's no difference between the two. That's a good point. Yeah. It's pretty true. It is, it is dating one on one. So I mean, you're a hiring manager. You know this is like you got to have the right type of person working with you. I mean, there there might be three or four of those right types of people, but you know, you get one of those folks that are outside. They just don't jive with the rest of the team, right? Yeah. And therefore, you're not producing the right product. Yeah, there's a lot to say to that. With like uh, the one thing you hear more about than anything else is culture in a workplace, right? I'm sure you're all about this. Never heard of it. You never heard of that? Okay, <laughs> next subject. But if, if you can, in theory, uh, if you were getting real fine tooth with it, you could essentially create cultures before they occur with right. AI by selection. Absolutely, right. and, 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 and recruiters do that today, by the way. Yeah. So I get cross sections, like early on a startup, it's, it's like, holy crap, okay, we just got bought by a PE company, we've combined two companies, the cultures are off, this company's like, you know, they're from the old school, like, you know, telecom days, this company's new and like mm -hmm. interactive and SaaS and all that kind of good stuff. Right. Totally different people. So in order to kind of build that around, 
It's like you, you have to go get cross sections of different companies. You know, my job is to look at other companies. You know, if I'm a recruiter, right? If I'm sitting in a recruiter's chair right now, I'm I'm going out. I'm looking at different companies. I'm getting cross sections of like, you know what? This this CSM team, you know, really looks like you know customers, success customers. managers, okay, yeah. account managers, whatever you want to call them. Looks like a really good group, and I bet that manager, you know, if you get three to four people to follow that person over, right? So let's grab that group, let's entice that manager with a really good comp package and a plan, and then let's use our recruiter, you know, to go back and get the rest of our crew so we're not, you know, crossing any lines, right? So it, it, we do that all the time. Interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's called, you know, kind of dog eat dog. It's like, you know, the 50 million companies are, 50, dollar, 50, 50 million dollar companies are stealing from the 50 million dollar companies, but we're also looking at, you know, Facebooks and Amazons of the world, right. um, and you know you can't secure every day with you can't secure everybody with comp today, right? It's more what I'm hearing more of today is it's about the opportunity. Right. Everybody wants to fake work for Facebook for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. You get inside of Facebook, it's not all that was cut out of me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm sure you heard it before. I've heard a lot of stories about a lot of things. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing about like the the recruiters. Uh, strategy around recruiting specific people. Is there, is there anything else like that? I mean, no. is there any, there's no other like uh, one-off situations that as the, as the recruit E would be of interest like that? Because I don't really have a question to ask that would draw that out, so I guess I'll just ask. So that would draw... Like so uh, any, you're, any specific things that recruiters do to like pick very specific people at very specific companies. Yeah, I mean, you look at companies that are in the same, you know, industry, that, that same vertical, that have a really good track record of growth. Mm -hmm. Maybe company A that I'm looking at is five years down the road, and I'm representing, you know, maybe a one-year-old PE-backed, you know, tax firm, right? Um, somebody that's been there five years, guess what they've done? Exactly what we want to do in five yeah. years. So, that, that's an easy pick. That's right. an easy pick. So it's like, that's the strategy behind it. It's like, this person's accomplished what we want to do with their group of people. Let's see if they can do it again. Let's see if they can do it again. And you know what? They're probably going to want to do it again because it's really freaking fun, right? Yeah. Um, because th those are the people who like to build things. And, and then you start to look back in their resume. And they've made strategic moves in within their career to actually say, you know what? I like that. Let's go do it again. Yeah. Let's go do it again here. And they're builders. And, and look, you don't expect 10 years out of that person. You expect three to five years. You expect what they did last time. Exactly. Yeah. Well, right. That's, and and that's you, the reason. And you reactively, you you don't reactively recruit. You re proactively recruit. And that person starts to get things sewn up and really kind of in the right position. Hmm. You start to look at, you know, do we promote this person to the executive ranks or do we move on and go grab somebody else? Do we promote one of their proteges? How does that look? Um, and you see it in companies. It's very easy to see once you start to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Tricky business, man. It is. It's tricky business, but here's the good news. It's like everything that I'm doing or anybody else is doing as a recruiter is is completely, you know, something that we can train machines to do. Yeah. That's wild. This is one of those things that um, I've, I've only been on one side of it. So it's like very interesting to hear what the other side looks like. And it's very interested. It's very interesting to hear like what the future of the other side looks like. It's gonna be nuts. All at once, man. It's all gonna be nuts. And you know, the the whole you know web presence and, and things like that's all gonna change too, right? Yeah. Um. There, you know, LinkedIn's a great tool. It's been around for quite a while now, but it's not the end all be all, right? Yeah. There, you start to see other things kind of bubble up. You know, where people are professionally building profiles, like you know GitHub. You know, they're they're. They're, they're communities of people with like-minded interest, interest and, and those are going to be recruiter hotspots. Those are going to be the hotspots to where, you know, AI is out gathering profiles of these people. They're, they're filtering them down and, and putting them in front of a recruiter and say, let's take some action on these group of people because they've already done what we're trying to do here. Yeah, so speaking of web, web presence, I'll shift topic a little bit here. It's like, uh, did you Google me? <laughs> I, I did. That's where I found all your speeches. It was big, actually. Uh, banged, you banged me. I banged him. <laughs> so, there, web presence is an interesting thing because uh, this is going to be the first generation that grew up inside of a web presence. Mm -hmm. So anything you've ever said has been tracked. Right. And like you can go back through and try to delete old tweets or Facebook posts. It's still out there. So, 
Um, like there's been these kids that are getting hauled up uh, on ESPN for saying something. Just watching were, that today. When they were 10 or 12. Yeah, or and it's so dumb. 17. And so, like, uh, in terms of a clean web presence, it's like, um, if you are 15 and feeling rebellious one day and you put something on the internet that you shouldn't say, mm -hmm. now it's out there forever. Does that, is, do you think that will play in or will that be weighted? Mm, no, I mean, you got to think, think about it. We're not, this is not the NFL, you know. For, right. For like, it's like, we're not, we're not putting people up that are, you know, possibly going to influence the rest of the kids. Try to be role models. Right, right. try to be role models, right? Um, in some instances, yes, in the executive head of the world, absolutely. Yeah. Think about it. It's like, you want a snapshot. You want a picture of, you know, what this person has done over the years. And look, we all got stuff in our background. I know I do that. I don't, I'm perfect. Okay. For the record. Okay. Axiom. I've done that I'm being you, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, you know, they, they, everybody's got something in their background. They're like, ah, shit, I, said, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. Or, right. You know, done anything like that. And then, you know, this was... This was stupid, um, but at the end of the day, it's not going to disqualify us all, right? There's, yeah. there's there's a means and there's really a person, you know, behind everybody, and there and there's an actual like interaction and story there, and that's what we want to get down to is like, what's this person's story, you know, and how does it, you know, how does it present in the work life? Yeah, and I one of the reasons I asked that question is a, I think we're all kind of uh, going to be measured on a different scale in terms of web presence in the future, because I think that will get really complicated. Mm -hmm. And then, um, in terms of recruiting, mm -hmm. uh, this country recruits one person every four years to do a big job, and we don't need to talk politics at all, but um, if you're going to if you're gonna be a president or a senator or a congressman or even a district, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. in 20 years and you're running on a platform of, uh, hey, we need to do things right, say honest things, or we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and people can look at your entire existence. It's already and, happening. Where you haven't done it? Exactly, it's already happening. Yeah. So if we're going to have a, a president in 50 years, like <laughs> that person can have never existed. Their birth picture is going to be on the internet somewhere. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Or their mom's taking a picture of them uh, as a baby right now and putting it on their Facebook. Exactly. And their parents have a checkered past. So it's going to be this never-ending... Uh, but where do you draw the line? Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's 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 a human responsibility to draw a line somewhere. So, right. talent robot is never ever going to be made. Well, I'm not I'm not dragging talent robot into this. Right. I'm just like opening up the conversation. I think it's a great conversation, but, but you know, a lot of people are dinging me. It's like I'm doing market research now, and the first thing is like I'm hesitant to participate in this because I feel like this is going to take away my job. And I'm like, it's not built for that. It's it's there to build and to make your yeah. job better. I actually, to have that response more than once. Oh, I don't want to help you make this. I don't. Want, I don't want to do your survey because I feel like this is a technology that it's threatening, you know, yeah. to, to my job. And, and you know, these are these are recruiters, right? You know, people that I need data. Only oh, the recruiters. Absolutely. Okay. Think about it. Uh, so I mean, it's it's not about that. It's not, you know, it's not taking the human aspect out of it. It's just it's presenting it's presenting data in a in a more formal way in an easier way for a human to digest, right? Yeah. That you know, again without emotion, bias, or anything like that, and you're dragging all that, you're looking at data profiles, much like a financial analyst would, right? Yeah. Um, or, or you know, somebody that works in BI, they're looking at data models, and they're presenting data models to stakeholders that can make decisions on. Recruiting is the same thing, right? Right. But it's perfectly like emotional, because you've got folks like me and you know the other 10 million recruiters out there making decisions on it. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, mean, I get where you're going with like, hey, you know, somebody's taking a picture of the next president and putting it on their Facebook and their mom's probably got a checkered pass or, you know. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But, but the, the, what I was getting to is like, there's the human aspect of it. It's like, as humans, right, we're faulted. We're, we, we grew up broken, right? It, it doesn't matter what we do. There's not the perfect human being. There was only one perfect human being, um, in my opinion. Right. Uh, <laughs> and and that's, that's where I want to go with that. It's like, hey... You know, we have to we have to look at ourselves as individuals that, yeah, we, you know, we screw up, right? Our, our but, parents screwed up, right? So, the, it, looking at this um, from a statistical breakdown is with more data, mm -hmm. the constraints can become greater and greater and greater. So there's only sure. uh, so many people that will fit through that gate, right. essentially. And then if if you have a whole lifetime of data and uh, finely tuned statistical breakdowns of who can actually do this job, and I'll just use the president as an example. Sure. 
there becomes a time when no one can do it. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, and that's that's what we do as humans all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like we're like, it, you see it in hiring managers, and hopefully yeah. well, you're not this type of hiring manager. Not at all. Like, never. Like, never anything wrong. There's nothing on my Twitter that you need to see. <laughs> <laughs> they get well. They're like, look, I really like this person, right? And I think they could do the job. It's just, I don't know, you know. And, and, and it's it, it's about making that decision. It's like. Eh, you know, present a little data there, you know, mm -hmm. that would help that decision along. It, data is only data, right? And it's all in the presentation. It's like the fajitas, right? You don't buy the fajitas because it's, you know, warm meat on a plate. It's the sizzle, right? So anybody can present data. Did you work at Chili's though? No. I never worked <laughs> in the restaurant industry. But Me either. The thing about it is, like, you know, people present data. You, you As a sales guy, man, you present data in a very, very consumable fashion that puts at ease the person on the other end of the table, um, you know, making that buying decision. Hey, right. I want to buy this because data proves that, you know, doing this is going to increase the ROI on whatever you're doing, right? Yeah. Um, so look, look at it from that perspective is presentable data is like, yeah, you got, you got stuff in the background, right? That everybody does. Maybe your mom or your, your, your great grandma back, you know, when Facebook started, <laughs> right. you know, was, you know, wasn't, you know, wasn't the perfect person on Facebook. Who cares? I, I saw someone, well, I, no, who cares in the future is a great question, but who cares right now is everybody, <laughs> right? Yeah, to a certain point. I mean, especially for those public type things. It is. I mean, do you want to make a decision based on like, yeah, if, if this person is, you know, some sort of, you know, extremist and, and it doesn't follow along with your company culture absolutely make a decision based on that I mean you're, you're potentially you know you're, you're potentially introducing something toxic within it to a business culture which you know at the end of the day is responsible for the product that you sell or, or that you put out um, so yeah you have to make decisions like that but that's a dynamic scope though over time right? yeah like what's really is it's yeah. like what is your culture i mean i get ceos asking me all the time or telling me all the time hey, i want to build a business culture yeah that's great but what does that mean to you? you know is it yeah. well it's family is it is it family or is it groups of people that is it michael be, scott maybe it could be <laughs> dwight michael scott albert <laughs> you know that's maybe the perfect thing yeah <laughs> uh yeah well a bunch of people in that office ended up becoming family which is hilarious any parting shots uh that you want to get in uh any, any pitches that you want us to be looking out for? Yeah, I mean, from talent robot that's I th coming up. I think uh, I think in the next uh, in the next three months, you know, look for you know if you're if you're in the recruiting space, if you're in HR, you know, I'm going to hit you up some shape, form, or fashion on some market research. I really want to have some compelling data to bring to investors at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, also, um, in March, you know, look for look for things that kind of start changing. You know, maybe maybe you drop into talent robot and. Um, you know, as an applicant, you have like a, a better experience, uh, or even in October, um, you know, you start to notice a change there. I mean, look, there's a lot of things that can happen right now, and for us, it's it's about measuring, you know, what tools are, are best and how to do that. I think we're the gatekeepers, uh, and certainly I've immersed myself in the staffing technology to, to understand it and make sure that, you know, if it's good technology and it belongs in the marketplace and, it, and it's something that, you know, we're going to make human decisions based off, right. then we want to introduce it into the platform some shape or form, right? And we don't make, we don't want to make it real bulky. So we're going to do it right the first time. Yeah, well, best of luck, man. I'd love to have you back on, uh, like, right around beta release time so we can That'd see what awesome, you came up with. That'd be awesome, man. That would be awesome. All right. Well, yeah. hey, thanks for your time. Yeah. Great to meet you. Yeah. Yeah.